So uh, I am going to talk about optimal partitions for the Yamabe equation. So I would like uh, to start by uh, recalling what the Yamabe problem is and what the relation of the Yamabe uh, equation with uh, geometry is. So the Yamabe equation is an elliptic equation on a, on a manifold. So here a manifold will be a closed Riemannian manifold of dimension larger than or equal to three. So by closed, I mean compact and without a boundary. And um, here uh, the delta G is just the usual Laplace Beltrami operator. SG is the, the scalar curvature function. This uh, AM is just a, a constant that depends on the dimension of the manifold. And this uh, guy two to the star is the usual critical Sobolev exponent that depends also only on the dimension of the manifold. So this is the Yamabe equation. The operator on the, on the left-hand side is LGU, uh, is called the conformal Laplace. And in fact, this, this equation has the property that uh, it is conformally invariant. That is, if you change the metric uh, in M by a conformal metric, then uh, the, the uh, equation does not change. The, the, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between, between solutions. So let me remind you where this equation comes in. So uh, if you have a, a closed smooth manifold and you take two Riemannian metrics on the manifold, then these two metrics are said to be conformally equivalent. If you can find a smooth function, a positive smooth function, so, such that G twiddles is rho times G, okay? And uh, there is a very classical result that was proved by Juan Carré and Kerbe. They show that uh, if, the, if, the, if your manifold has dimension two, so if your manifold is a surface, then it admits always a metric of constant curvature conformally equivalent to the given metric. So it's, it is natural to ask whether this uh, uh, result is still true when you uh, take higher dimensions. And this question was asked by Yamabe. This, it is uh, known as the Yamabe problem. So the question is whether every close Riemannian manifold, M with a metric G, admits a metric that is conformally equivalent to G for which the scalar curvature is constant. And Yamabe published a paper in 1960 giving a, giving a positive answer to this question, but unfortunately, unfortunately his proof was, uh, was not correct. So Trudinger discovered a, an important mistake, a fundamental mistake in the proof. And then it took uh, uh, many years and lots of effort around this question until it was solved, well, uh, the, the first, uh, important steps were taken by Oban in 1976. I will tell you a little bit more about that in, in just a moment. And finally, the last steps were, were taken by uh, Schoen. So the answer to the Yamabe problem is yes. And the, the relation of this question to the Yamabe question, uh, equation goes as follows. So if you take your metric G and you multiply it by a, a smooth function, a positive smooth function rho, and you write rho as u to the two to the star minus two, where u is a positive function, then the scalar curvatures of, of G and of uh, G twiddles are related by this equation. So if we want to solve the Yamabe problem, what we have to do is we, we have to put a constant here and ask ourselves whether this equation has a positive solution. So in other words, uh, um, solving the Yamabe problem reduces to, to solving this equation where this K is now some constant, okay? Now, this is the Euler-Lagrange equation for the functional given by this quotient. So this quotient is the, the Laplace, uh, the conformal Laplace of u times u. You take the integral of that and you divide it by the square of the L2 star norm. So you take this quotient and, uh, well, uh, 
one, one way to see whether this has a solution or not, particularly if you want to find a positive solution, would be to, be to see whether you have a minimizer of this portion. So you look at the infimum, and this infimum is called the Yamabe invariant. So this infimum indeed is invariant under conformal transformation. So it is an invariant under conformal diffeomorphisms. So let me first of all give you a, a simple example. Okay. So let us look at the standard sphere. So we look at the m-dimensional sphere in Rm plus one with a standard metric, with a metric induced by the metric in Rm plus one. And then we take the stereographic projection. So the stereographic projection is a conformal diffeomorphism. So this means that looking at the Yamabe problem on the sphere is the same as looking at the Yamabe problem on RM. But what's the Yamabe problem on RM? Well, the Yamabe problem on RM, on RM the, the scalar curvature is, is zero. The conformal Laplacian is the usual Laplacian. So what you get is this equation that's very familiar for people in PDE. And what is the, the Yamabe invariant? Well, the Yamabe invariant is you have to take the quotient of the integral of minus Laplace and u times u divided by the, the square of the uh, L2 star norm. But this is the same as taking this quotient, the, the integral of the norm of gradient u square divided by the square of the L2 norm. And this infimum is very well known for, for people in analysis. This is just the best uh, constant for the Sobolev embedding. So uh, what we have to do is we have to see whether this uh, infimum is attained. And in fact, it is very well known that this infimum is attained in RN, uh, in RM, excuse me. And uh, uh, in fact, one has a, an explicit solution that has this form and is called the standard bubble. And moreover, one knows that if one has a solution, then if you reparameterize re the solution in this way, you get again a solution. So now we see what the, the problem with Yamabe's proof was. So uh, the, the problem is that, I mean, if you want to, to minimize this quotient, you get that, take a minimizing sequence, and the problem is that the minimizing uh, sequence may perhaps not converge as it happens here. Here you have a sequence of minimizers and when epsilon goes to zero, what you have is blow up. So one has to have some condition that uh, prevents uh, blow up. And this condition was furnished by Oban. So what Oban showed is that if, if the Yamabe invariant of M is strictly smaller than the Yamabe invariant of the standard sphere, then this, uh, the Yamabe invariant of M is attained, and so the Yamabe problem has a solution. And uh, well, a natural way of, of proving this inequality, one has to find a test function, so a function for which the Yamabe quotient is smaller than the uh, best Sobolev, Sobolev constant, and so the natural thing to do is to take a point in M, you look at the tangent space, on the tangent space, you place the standard bubble, very dilated, and you project it via the, the, the exponential map onto the manifold. So that's a good uh, uh, idea for getting a test function. And in fact, this is what Toban did, but he was only able to prove that uh, this is a good test function in dimensions larger than or equal to six when the manifold M is not locally conformally flat. So this was Oban's contribution. In these cases, he, he obtained the proof of the, of the Yamabe conjecture and the rest of the cases are more subtle and require a more delicate construction for the test function. And that's what trend. Now, I would like to, to note here that, um, in fact, if, if the Yamabe invariant is smaller than or equal to zero, this is uh, trivially true. So we will assume from now on the most interesting case, which is the case where the Yamabe invariant is positive. 
Uh, this is the same as saying that the conformal Laplace, that the, yeah, the conformal Laplace is, is uh, coercive. Okay, so now let me tell you what an optimal partition is, okay? So an optimal partition, well, you, you start with a partition of your manifold. What is a partition of the manifold? It's a collection of L open sets, non-empty open sets that are pairwise disjoint. And now a partition will be called optimal. So uh, this partition will be said to be an optimal L partition for the Yamabe equation if the following two things hold uh, true. The first one is we want that on each one of these open sets, the, the Dirichlet problem for the Yamabe equation on this set uh, has a non-trivial solution. But not only that, we want that this solution is, has least energy so that it minimizes <clears throat> the Yamabe quotient on each one of these omega i's. And moreover, we want that the total energy uh, on, on all of the sets of the optimal partition is, is optimal in the sense that it minimizes all other possibilities for, for all other partitions. So this is an optimal partition. So what does it, this mean in, the te in terms of, of, of the geometry, okay? So if you take, you take your solution UI on each one of these omega i's and you add the solutions, so you get a function U bar. And if you take U bar to the two to the star minus two and you multiply it by your uh, metric G, you get a, knee, a two tensor G twiddles, but this is not a metric because U bar is zero at some places. U bar will be zero outside the union of the omega i's. So, but what you get is something that is called a generalized metric. And this means that uh, well, what you get is uh, this G, G twiddles will be a metric conformally equivalent to G in the union of the omega i's which has precisely L connected components. So each one of these omega i's is connected and it is a connected component. And on the complement, it is zero. And it also has minimal energy in the sense that uh, I, I showed you in the previous slide. So it is also interesting to understand what are the boundaries? What are the, the, the boundaries of, of the omega i? So what is the complement of the union of the omega i's in M? So we will talk about all of this. So the question we would like to answer is whether given a manifold, Mg, whether for every L there exists an optimal L partition. And the answer, is very simple. The answer is no, not always. So for example, if you take the standard sphere, the standard sphere does not admit an optimal L partition for any L larger than or equal to two. And the reason is that, uh, uh, well, if you look at the Yamabe equation on SM, it is the same as looking at the Yamabe equation on RM. So, but if you take an open set in RM whose complement has non-empty interior, then we know that this equation, the, the Dirichlet problem in omega, does not have a least energy solution. So this is a very well-known fact. So just because of this fact, uh, the sphere cannot admit an optimal L partition. So our object, our, our goal now is to, to give conditions for the existence of an optimal partition. Now, how do you produce an optimal partition. Well, here the idea is very nice. It is a, an idea that comes from quantum physics and it comes from the theory of Bose-Einstein condensates. So the idea is if, if uh, what is a Bose-Einstein con condensate? Well, this is a state of matter that is taken by some uh, particles or uh, subatomic particles of, or, or separate atoms when they are cooled down to almost zero temperature. So what happens is that the individual particles, uh, they stop being individual particles and they become a single quantum state. And now if you take a mixture 
of, uh, of uh, two of the, or more of these uh, particles, different types of particles having this property and you cool them down, what will happen is that the, uh, they will, uh, what the, the condensates will separate in space and uh, they don't intersect. Well, they almost don't intersect when they are cooled down to, to almost zero temperature. And uh, the mathematical model for this phenomenon is a, a system of elliptic equations. And it was uh, in, in works by Conti, Terracini, and Bertini, and by Chang, Lin, Lin, and Lin, that uh, they realized that there is a connection between elliptic systems with large competitive interaction and optimal partitions. So we will look at the system related to the Yamabe equation, which is the following one. So we look at the system of uh, uh, elliptic equations on the manifold M. So if you forget about the sum that's here, what you have here is simply the Yamabe equation. So we have the, the Yamabe equation for each component plus uh, a coupling term. And in this coupling term, we have some, some coefficients, lambda ij, uh, which in the physical model represent the force uh, uh, between the states uj and uh, ui. And since we want this force to be repulsive because we want the states to separate, we have to assume that the lambda ij's are negative. So we look at the system and this system of course has, has always a trivial solution, but we want to look for solutions that are fully non-trivial. This means that every component ui must be different from zero. Okay, so what is the strategy? So the strategy is, uh, first of all, we want to give conditions for the existence of fully non-trivial least energy, well, a fully non-trivial least energy solution to the Yamabe system, to the system, okay? And then, uh, well, we want to look afterwards what happens when the lambda ij's go to minus infinity. So when the repulsive force increases. So we want to study the limit profile of the components as the lambda ij's go to minus infinity. Then we want to give conditions to ensure that the limit profiles with, will produce an optimal partition for the Yamabe problem. And finally, we want to study the regularity properties of the free boundaries of the partition, okay? So this is the strategy. And now let me show you what the results are. So these results that I am going to present now are joint work with Angela Pistoia from uh, Rome and from our host, Hugo Tavares from, from Lisbon. So, uh, well, let me tell you what the results are. Okay. So, uh, the first result concerns the existence of solutions for the Yamabe system. And it says that under some conditions, the Yamabe system has a fully non trivial least energy solution. So, what are the conditions on M? First of all, the first condition is that M is not locally conformally flat. And the second condition is that the dimension has to be larger than or equal to nine. So of course one needs some conditions because it is easy to, to see that in fact the Yamabe system on the standard sphere, which is of course locally conformally flat, does not have a fully non-trivial least energy solution for any L, okay? So one needs indeed some conditions and uh, I will tell you about how these conditions appear in, in just a moment. But now let me go to the next result. So the next result says, so now we, we take our system, we take a least energy, a positive least energy, uh, fully non-trivial solution of the system, and we want to see what happens when lambda n goes to minus infinity. So, what are the limit profiles of the components, okay? 
So again, here we need some, some assumptions and the assumptions are a bit stronger now. So we need that M is not locally conformally flat, the dimension has to be larger than or equal to 10. And when the dimension is 10, we need a, a geometric condition. So this geometric condition says that the square of the scalar curvature has to be smaller than 528, the vial tensor square. Okay. So the vial tensor is, is a sum and a part of the, of the, of the curvature tensor, that is, which is the part that is conformally invariant. So this is a, a guy that appears often in this type of, of problem. So now, if these assumptions are true, what can we say about uh, the, the components of the system when the lambdas go to minus infinity? But the first thing that we can see is that they converge. So the, the components converge strongly in the Sobolev norm and also in the Helder norm. So they converge to a function which is non-negative and non-trivial. So now since each one of these U uh, infinity i's is continuous, if we look at the set where they are strictly positive, since they are non-trivial, this is a non-empty set and it is open. And in fact, the U infinity i solves the Yamabe equation with Dirichlet boundary conditions on this omega i. So this omega i is the good candidate for being, uh, 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 for giving us an optimal partition. And in fact, the, the next uh, uh, statement says that uh, the omega one to omega L is an optimal L partition for the Yamabe equation. So in particular, each one of these omega i's is connected. Now the next statement tells us what the, the boundaries are. So if you take the complement of the union of the omega i's in M, this consists of the union of a regular set and a singular set. So the regular set is a C1 alpha sub manifold of dimension M minus one of M, and the singular set is a closed subset of dimension smaller than or equal m minus two. So in particular, this is telling us that m is the union of the closures of the omega i's, okay? So the complement is very thin. It has dimension at most uh, m minus one. And finally, another byproduct of this uh, uh, result is that if you take L equal to two, so you have only two equations, you have only two limit profiles. The limit profiles are positive. So when you take this difference, you get a function that changes sign. And it is indeed a least energy sign changing solution for the Yamabe equation on N, okay? So putting these two results together, the first one tells us we have always a least energy solution for the Yamabe system. And the, the, then this last theorem tells us something about the behavior of the, about the limit profiles. So if we put these two results together with the stronger assumptions of the second result, what we get is two existent results. The first existent result says that for each L, we have an optimal partition for the Yamabe equation, okay? And the optimal partition is very nice. So each omega i is connected and the complement is the union of a regular and a singular set uh, where the regular set is a manifold of dimension m minus one and the singular set is uh, has dimension smaller than or equal m minus two. Okay. Then we also get when we take a, a system of two equations so what we get is a least energy nodal solution for the Yamabe equation. Okay, now let me comment a little bit on this uh, last result. There is a previous result by Aman and Umber in uh, 2006, where they proved the existence of a least energy nodal solution for the Yamabe equation when M is not locally conformally flat and has dimension larger than or equal to 11. 
So this result improves uh, the result a little bit. So we are now allowing the dimension to be 10, provided this uh, uh, geometric condition is satisfied. Okay. Of course, again, one cannot uh, assume that uh, this is true without any condition because on the standard sphere, there is no least energy, no other solution. Okay, so now I would like to say a few words about the proofs of these results. So let me start with the, the existence of a solution for the Yamabe system. So we, we, we are looking for a minimizer. So the Yamabe system is variational. So we have a variational functional and energy functional associated to it. And we have, a, uh, we have to look for a minimizer on a suitable constraint, okay? So again, here the problem is that a minimizer does not always exist. Why, why is this? Well, because we have, again, this blow up phenomenon. So we have to be careful with blow up. And what we need first to do is to provide a condition that prevents blow up. So we establish first a compactness condition that ensures the existence of a minimizer. So it is a condition that uh, reduces to, to the to advanced condition, the one I told you about at the beginning of the talk, when you have only one equation. So we have to prove that certain inequality holds true, and for that we need a test function. So we, we introduce a test function, which is a kind of the natural test function that one can think of that involves the test function that is used for the Yamabe problem, okay? And then we have to do some computations. We have to see that uh, uh, what is the energy of, of the solution that uh, of this test function uh, to see that our compactness condition is satisfied. And here, fortunately, there are there, there were some estimates that were obtained by by Esposito, Pistoia, and Vetois in 2014, and we use these estimates. And uh, when we when we uh, uh, computed the, the energy, well, we saw that we needed the the assumptions uh on the on the manifold that uh, that uh, are stated in this theorem namely we need that the manifold is not locally conformally flat and it has dimension larger than or equal to nine so so these assumptions come in to prevent blow up okay so the next thing is now we want to to look at a least energy fully non-trivial solution of the system and we want to see what happens when the lambda n goes to minus infinity. So the first thing that is easy to see is that the, the components converge weakly in the Sobolev space. Okay, so now uh, what we claim is the following. We claim that these solutions give us what we call a weak optimal L partition. So what does this mean? So the claim is this guy satisfy the following. First of all, they are different from zero. They are non-trivial. Secondly, they uh, belong to the Nehari manifold of the Yamabe problem. So this, this is what this equality means, okay? Thirdly, they have uh, pairwise disjoint supports, okay? And finally, the total energy me is minimal with respect to any functions uh, that satisfy the first three properties. So we claim, our first claim is that indeed these guys are a weak optimal L partition. So they satisfy this problem. And the main thing that we have to prove here is that the, the U infinity I is different from zero. This means that there is no blow up. So again, what we need is a compactness condition. So, so we establish a compactness condition that ensures that this, the skies are different from zero. And then we have to estimate the energy. So, so we have to find a test function. Here, the test function is more involved 
and we have to, to uh, derive very delicate uh, energy estimates. And here is where the assumptions on the manifold come in. So here we need higher dimensions. We need dimension larger than or equal to 10. And in dimension 10, we need this extra uh, geometric assumption I told you about. So again, these assumptions are to prevent the uh, uh, blow up, okay? Okay, now, so once we have a weak optimal partition, well, we want to find, we want to see that this partition is a real partition, a true partition. And for that, all we need to do is we, we need to show that uh, these uh, guys are continuous on, on M, okay? If they are continuous, then if we look at the set where they are non-zero, well, this will be open, of course, because if this is continuous, this is open, and it is then not difficult to see that this is an optimal L partition. So the crucial part is this regularity problem. So this reduces the question to a regularity question. And now to prove regularity, what we need is to show, uh, uh, to obtain uniform Helder bounds for the components of the solutions of the system for the lambda ends, okay? So we, we have to look at, uh, to see that these components are uniformly held their bound, okay? And this is a local problem, this is a local question. So we have to look at the system locally. So if we look at the system in local coordinates, the Yamabe system becomes a system in an open set in RM that looks like this, okay? It is a non-autonomous system, this coefficient a of x is simply the square root of the determinant of the metric written in, in the local coordinates. This A of x is the, the small A of x multiplied by the inverse of the, of the metric written in local co coordinates. This f is just, well, what it has to be, okay? So what we have to see is that uh, uh, we have to look at this system, which is now a system on RM, but this is uh, um, uh, not as simple as the, as the previous one. And we have to see that uh, the components are uniformly held bound. And here, fortunately, we have an expert, expert to, to, to guide us in, in, uh, in this, in this question. So, um, this, uh, there is a result that was uh, usually uh, originally proved by Noris uh, Tavares Terracini and Verzini that show that when A, this matrix A is the identity and the little a is equal to one, then indeed was one has uniform Hölder bounds. And uh, what we did to prove this is we follow a paper by, by Suave Tavares Terracini and Silio. And, well, other papers, but this was the main reference. And, uh, okay, what about the, the, the regularity of the boundaries? So if we look at the, the question on the free boundaries, then again, this is local. So again, we have to look at the, 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 lo the system in local coordinates that we just talked about. And here, what we do is what do we extend some res uh, results that were proved by, by Tavares and Terracini when A is the identity and little a is equal to one, okay? And again, well, here it was uh, great to have uh, Hugo's help because he knew precisely what were the delicate points and what, has one, what was needed to do. So this was really uh, uh, Hugo's work. Okay. And finally, regarding the, the question about uh, this difference uh, in the, when the system has only two equations and we look at the difference of the profiles, whether this is a least energy nodal solution, this is, uh, uses very standard arguments, for instance, uh, that one can find in the paper, in the classical paper by Castro, Cosio, Newberg. So, so this, is, this is very simple. Once one has the, 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 the profiles and one knows that they are non-trivial and they don't blow up, okay? Okay, so this is more or less how the proofs go. So now, okay, so what about, uh, okay, so now we know 
that we have in some cases, at least energy nodal solution. But of course, this is not true in all cases. So for the sphere, for example, at least energy nodal solution does not exist. And we believe in fact that our assumptions are kind of optimal. We don't, I mean, it seems that one cannot uh, do better than, than or, or one cannot do much better than what we did. So it is, um, we have, we, uh, at least we don't, don't know how to, how to produce least energy uh, nodal solutions on the more general uh, assumptions, on the, on the weaker assumptions. But I mean, one can always ask, whether there are nodal solutions that perhaps are not, do not have least energy, okay? So the next question I want to address is whether the Yamabe equation has higher energy nodal solutions, okay? So this is the last point of my talk and uh, it, it regards symmetric optimal partitions. So now I am going to look, well, this is joint work Part of it is joint work with Angela, and uh, the part with the sphere is joint work, work with uh, Alberto Saldana and Andre Schulke. So, uh, well, so now this time I am going to look at uh, a manifold M with, together with a group of isometries of M. So G will be a group of isometries of the manifold M. And uh, I will denote by GP the, the G orbit of the point P. So you take a point P in M and you apply all transformations in G and this is called the G orbit of P. So let me give you an example. So let us take the standard sphere. So it, uh, it is contained in RM plus one. And now let me split RM plus one and write it as Rn1 times Rn2, okay? And let me take G to be the group of all linear isometries of Rn plus Rn1 times all linear isometries of Rn2, where N1 plus N2 is equal to the, the full dimension N plus one, okay? So what is the G orbit of a point in the sphere? So the G orbit of a point in the sphere is either the product of the sphere in dimension N1 minus one times the sphere in uh, dimension N, N2 minus one, or one of this single spheres. okay? So here is a picture. So I am taking a picture in dimension three. So I am looking at S3, but uh, since I cannot make a picture of that, I, I look at the stereographic projection. So I am looking at R3 and I am taking N1 and N2 to be equal to two. So N1 and N2 are equal to two. So these spheres are just circles. And what are the circles? The cir one of the circles is, goes in the center of all of this tori and the other circle is the, the C axis together with the point at infinity. And the other orbits are just this tori, this uh, green tori that uh, you can see here, okay? So these are the G orbits in, the, in dimension three. And what I want you to notice here is that uh, if uh, N1 and N2 are larger than or equal to two, like in this example, then the dimension of the of every orbit is larger than or equal to one. Okay, so this will be very important. So now, what is a, an optimal partition in the symmetric context? Well, you just put a G all over the place. So now we are going to look at partitions that consists of uh, in G invariant sets. So now the omega i will be G invariant, which means if a point is in omega i, the whole orbit is in omega i. And what is an optimal GL partition? Well, it is a, a partition such that on each one of these guys, you can find a non-trivial, now G invariant solution. G invariant means that UI is constant on every G orbit. 
So we want to uh, we, we we want that uh, on each one of the sets there is a G invariant uh, solution to the Dirichlet problem that minimizes the Yamabe quotient now which now should be understood in the G invariant set, the sense. So we have to take this infimum over functions that are G invariant. And we also want this property that the full en the total energy uh, is minimal with respect to all other partitions, okay? So what is the result this time? Well, we, we can repeat the whole thing and look at the system and so forth and so on, but let me just state the result on the existence of partitions. So um, the theorem says the following. It says, if every G orbit, if the G orbit of every point in M has dimension larger than or equal to one and smaller than the dimension of M, this is because we don't want M to be a full orbit, right? So then there exists an optimal GL partition for the Yamabe equation with the same properties as before. So the omega i's are connected. The complement consists of uh, a regular and a singular set with the same properties as before, okay? But now you see the nice thing about this result is that we are, have no requirements on M. We don't need that M is not locally conformally flat. We don't need that M has dimension so and so. We only need this requirement on the dimension of the orbits. And why is this? So let me tell you why this is true. The point is that blow up for this type of problems can occur only at points. So if now we are looking at partitions where the UIs are assumed to be G invariant, this means that UI is constant on every G orbit. And since every G orbit has dimension larger than or equal to one, it does not consist of points. So you cannot have blow up. So this is the main idea. Blow up can only occur at points. The components are G invariant. The dimension is, is uh, larger than, than or equal to one. So the, the orbit is, is a manifold, uh, uh, which, is, which has dimension larger than, than or equal to one. And so blow up cannot occur. And since the conditions that we previously had were only there to prevent blow up, well, this is enough now to prevent blow up, okay? So now you see the nice thing about this is we can apply it, for example, to the sphere because we don't require that the manifold is not locally conformally flat. And this is what we did, uh, what we are going to do now uh, for this particular example that I showed you at the beginning. So let us take G uh, to be the group I told you about at the beginning. And uh, uh, okay, and then we know that the G orbit is either a product of, or, of spheres or a single sphere, okay? Now I would like to look at the orbit space, okay? So we take the sphere and we identify every orbit to a single point. So each orbit goes to a single point. This is called the orbit space. So what is the orbit space of the sphere? The orbit space at the sphere is simply a closed interval, an arc, okay? You can look at the, at the quotient mar, map uh, as given in this way. So it is very easy to see that the, that the orbit space is simply a closed interval. So this means uh, if you look at the endpoints of the interval, they correspond to the, to the orbits that are just a single sphere. And the points inside in the interior of the interval, they correspond to the orbits that are products of, of spheres, okay? So now let us look at our partition. Let us look at that, our G invariant partition, optimal partition, on the sphere. So it consists on, 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 of open sets that are connected and G invariant. So when you project them to the orbit space, they will give you open connected sets. And what is an open connected subset of a closed interval? Well, it is an interval. 
So if if the interval that you that you take does not touch the, the boundary, then its inverse image will look like the product of spheres times an interval, times the interval that you have here. And if it touches one of the endpoints, then it will look like a ball, the corresponding ball times the sphere. And this is the idea in the following result. Actually, this result was obtained previously before all of this by, by uh, 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 Alberto Saldana, Andrew Shulkin, and myself. This is already published. And so what, what we prove is that there exists an optimal partition, a gene variant optimal partition for the group that I mentioned before on the sphere, which looks like this. So one, one important thing is that if you look at, at the projection of the partition on the interval, this gives you automatically an order for the, for the partition. You take first, say, the one that contains one of the endpoints, end and then the next one, and so forth and so on. So you have a natural ordering. And if you take this ordering, then your partition will look like this. So in the, in the, in the three-dimensional case, what you will have is the first uh, set is a torus, this solid green torus. The second set is the yellow uh, solid torus minus the green torus. The third set is the, the solid blue torus minus the yellow torus. And finally, the last set is the complement of the blue set, which looks like this, which is the product of a ball times a sphere. Okay. And what is the, the, the complement? Well, the complement of the partition simply uh, consists of a, a finite union of products of sphere. Okay? So this is a very explicit, a very uh, nice uh, uh, description of the partition that one gets. Just because, I mean, you get it just because of the symmetry. It's no, no big deal, but it's nice, I think. Okay, and now we still have an extra piece of information. Now we have the, the solution that uh, is attached, the solution to the, to the Dirichlet problem on each one of these guys. So if we look at these solutions, the positive one, the U infinity I, and we take these guys with uh, alternating signs, so you take the positive, positive in the green one, the negative in the next one, and so forth and so on, you get a function that changes time. And it is, in, in fact, a G invariant nodal solution to the Yamabe equation on the standard sphere, which has precisely L nodal domains, and it has least energy among all of these solutions. Okay? So you get, in particular, infinitely many solutions, but we, you get more information than that. You, you know that. Uh, the solution that you get here has precisely changes sign, precisely L times, and it has least energy among all of those. Well, in fact, the existence of infinite, infinitely many sign changing solutions, it was shown by Dean many years ago. And uh, he used the same uh, group that I have been working with in this last uh, slides. So uh, Dean established the existence of infinitely many sign-changing solutions for the Yamabe equations already in 1986. But uh, he said nothing about uh, the, the nature or, or of the nodal domains. And then there is a very nice result that was uh, a recent result by Fernandez and Petian, where they use ODE methods to, to show the existence of a solution to the Yamabe equation, a gene variant solution, with precisely L nodal domains. Okay, so they, they, they were able to show this, that there is a solution for, with L nodal domains for each L using very different methods to the ones that we have been using today. And our contribution with, with Alberto and Andre was uh, to, to see that uh, the solution that we, that we get has least energy among all of these solutions. And uh, well, with this, I, I, I will stop. And I want to thank you very much for, uh, for listening. <laughs>